Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yanny, and today we're going to be talking about the best way to speak to the world and witness about Jesus Christ is the power of love and the power of the Word, putting them together. Let your works be always with grace, seasoned with salt, which is the promises of the Word of God. Let's go to the Word of God today because I believe after this, you'll be better equipped to lead people to Jesus Christ. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello and glad to have you with us today. This is Bob Yandian and this is Student of the Word. Thanks for joining in with us. While you're turning to the subject, this, the scripture we were talking about, Proverbs chapter 15, verses one and two. I just wanna say a big thank you to those who watch daily, those who are partners with me, and those who just write in occasionally with a great blessing of what the word of God has done for you. This is a reward in and of itself that the word being sown is received. I got one here from Chandra, who says, I just wanna drop a note to say a huge thank you for both your teaching and for how often they come out. I've been watching your show on YouTube for well over a year or so. I've noticed all kinds of verses popping into my heart right when I needed them. That's great. That's the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you how much that means. Not only have I learned an incredible amount of theology and become wise, but I've also have verses right here that encourage people and use as my guide in any situation. It's more than I could have ever asked for. And again, she says, thank you. You know, that's again what the word of God has to say. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will lead you and guide you, first of all, into all truth. What I'm giving you here is a panorama of things of different subjects, different scriptures of which when you run into problems, guess what? The Holy Spirit's gonna reach back there and pull a scripture out that you learn and all of a sudden you'll see a whole new meaning of it as God simply presents it. That's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk about that the weapon that the world has is words and what God has given us. You know, when we talk about the weapons of our warfare, most of them are defensive weapons. We have the defense of, you know, the shield and, and the, the helmet and all that, but we have an offensive weapon, which is, is the word of God. We're gonna talk about how we use that today. First of all, a defensive weapon, then an offensive weapon. We're going to talk about the attitude that sh should surround you whenever the world comes at you. And today, man, they're coming at us every direction. More and more, they're picking on conservatives and more and more, they're picking on Christians going after us because we believe the word of God. And we should never back down. We should not. But on the other hand, we shouldn't get angry. Anger is what they're after because they come at us with anger wanting us to retaliate in anger. We're gonna find out from what the word of God has to say. Proverbs 15, verses one and two. A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge, that is the word of God, and notice this correctly. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge correctly, but the mouth of a fool pours out foolishness. Above all, we don't want to be a believer who acts like the world because then we become a fool as they are by walking in love toward them, walking in understanding toward them, and walking in the fact that we know they've been deceived and the truth will do what we can't do. We think somehow it's our intellect. We think it's the way we approach it. We think somehow this is a debate and this is not a debate. We will all have to answer the world questions one day or another, so you might as well just get prepared for it now because the Word of God teaches you how. How we answer is just as important as what we say or what we answer. A soft answer should precede the good words that we're about to put out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the Bible says the mouth or the tongue speaks and it reflects the heart. My response one time to hecklers, I was in Oklahoma City, a lady invited me that went to our church, asked me to come and speak in front of a giant group of protesters that came to protest capital punishment. And she said, would you just speak on what the Bible has to say about it? And so when I got there, the place was packed. There were hundreds and hundreds that filled that entire place there at the state capital, Oklahoma City, with big signs and yelling and screaming. And so the man got up to introduce me and finally got everybody settled down, introduced me. The moment I walked up there, one man stood up in the back and screamed at me and said, how dare you worship a God that murdered his son on the cross? My first thought was, I didn't I never heard that before. Never had anybody challenge me that way. And then my next thought is, Holy Spirit, you better give me something. And he did. 
Right then, scriptures began to come to me. I said, sir, uh, God didn't kill his son on the cross. I said, Jesus said, I pick up my life when I want to. I lay it down when I want to. And on the cross, he said two things. Father, into your hands, I dismiss my spirit. And he gave up his spirit. I said, Jesus didn't, you know, Jesus wasn't killed by his father. Jesus laid his life down because he chose to do that. And because he chose to do it, God took the sins of the whole world, including yours, sir, and placed it on Jesus and Jesus died for it. And that includes all that are here. And I said, everybody bow your head. And I led everybody in a sinner's prayer. There must have been eight, 900 people there that came for that, that protest. And they all had their heads bowed and I led them in a prayer. I trust when I get to heaven, I'm gonna meet a whole bunch of them that were there. And God just simply turned the situation around as I did. I did not back down to him, but I didn't yell at him and scream at him like he was yelling at me. I came across with authority in love. Second Timothy chapter three, verses one through three says this. Know this, then the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves. Boy, does that apply to today? Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. That means everything is owed to you, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, and despisers of good. The world gives us an attitude and words that back it with little reason. Slanderous words should not be answered back with slanderous words. Don't return evil for evil. 1 Peter chapter 3, this is a great verse of scripture, verses 13 through 17 says this, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you're blessed. Do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that's in you. Notice this with meekness and reverence, having a good conscience, so that when they defame you as an evildoer, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Your defense should be given with meekness. You know what that means? Having a teachable attitude. So being teachable is very important. Speak with reverence for God and respect for the person himself. There was a show on TV one time on The View. I'm sure you know about it. Whoopi Goldberg was on it. And Tom Selleck was invited to be on there. And they brought him on because not only was a great actor and all that, but he was conservative. They just wanted to nail him. And Whoopi Goldberg would not back down. She just kept on and kept on. I love it. Tom Selleck sat there with that typical attitude he has on TV, on his show. And he just answered her questions and he would not get angry. He just kept answering her questions correctly. Everything she had, she was yelling about, he would give a common sense answer to it. And finally, after a while, she saw she was going nowhere and actually she felt bad about it. She apologized to him for her attitude. Notice what turned her around was that attitude that he had of self-control, that attitude of humility. And on top of that, an attitude of even being teachable. He listened to her and said, well, I, I kind of see that, but let me tell you, in other words, he was even open to her coming at him to learn whatever he could learn. So what do we use as our main defense? Colossians chapter four, verses five and six says this, walk in wisdom toward those on the outside. Those on the outside are unbelievers. So we are to walk in wisdom toward the world out there. You know what wisdom is? It's the correct application of knowledge. Knowledge is taking in the word of God and wisdom is applying it toward the world around us. It's the correct application of knowledge. So walk in wisdom toward those on the outside. Outside the camp is unbelievers. Notice this, redeeming or buying back the time. It says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Grace simply means your attitude, and then seasoned with salt means you use the word of God. Take the con the concepts of the word of God, even might even quote a scripture, but do it in grace. It goes on to say that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. You know what everyone means? Sinners and saints alike, because there's a lot of saints out there caught up in wrong things, caught up in cults, even caught up in views that are contrary to the Bible. And it simply notice this, grace comes before salt. Your attitude, first of all, then the scriptures. Make sure before you quote scriptures, you're not pulling out the sword and stabbing them with it. Notice, first of all, that you come them with salt, which is the right attitude. 
And then after that, we use the scripture. So grace comes before salt. That means a good attitude first, then you quote the word of God. Notice this again, you're not a psychologist. They'll come to you with the world's, in essence, they choose the uh, arena. They choose psychology, they choose argument, they choose debate, and they pull you into their arena. By doing this, you pull them back into your arena. You pull them back into the grace of God and you pull them back into the word of God. That's why again, it says, speak the truth in love in Ephesians chapter four and verse 14. So the truth is the most important thing, but how you present it, it also important. You pull them back over onto your mat to where you're used to fighting from over here or used to defending yourself from over here, but you also know that the best way to do it is with finesse to do it with with love toward them and and, and, a, and a desire to see them come to know Jesus Christ. And again, to where you pour your heart out to them, but you pour it out with the word of God. With an attitude of grace, simply say, it is written. The word itself needs so no outside proof or defense. What am I saying? I'm saying when you start to use the word of God, just the power of the Holy Spirit that surrounds them will grab them. They have a hard time understanding it, but they also know something. How do you argue with the word of God? They will try. And they'll try pulling their psychology into it and all that. But all you need to do is continue to stand on the word of God because why? The word of God needs no outside proof. Everything they're saying, in fact, when the world quotes something, they'll quote Dr. So-and-so said this, Professor So-and-so said this, uh, Mr. So-and-so, a theologian said this. They'll start quoting from history. Folks, once you quote the word of God, there's nothing higher than the word of God. You know why they need all these other things to prop up their viewpoints is because they know it won't stand by itself. But as soon as they start attributing to other famous people, it's like the fame of the person they're quoting actually lends credibility to what they're saying. And that is just not true with the word of God. It is the word of God. Romans chapter three and verse 10 says this, as it is written, and this is from the Psalms and the prophets, there is none righteous, no, not one. He didn't quote. I mean, once in a while he'll say, Moses said this, or he'll say some of the other prophets, but he'll never have to say, and professor so-and-so said this, or theologian said this, or the man from history said this. God just simply says, and Jesus quoted it here as Paul did also, it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. If the word wants to prove something, it quotes itself. (laughs) Think about that. It simply quotes itself. When Paul was trying to show that this is true, he didn't go out there and get, again, some theologian, go out there and get some professor, he didn't go out there and get some prophet from the world. He simply said, here's what the word says. The word stands by itself. It proves itself. God exalted his word above him, very self. Nothing is higher than the word of God. God took the word of God and sticks it up there about everything. As God could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Every idea, every philosophy, every religion is beneath the word of God. Who can add to God's person or what he has written? The Old Testament says, thus saith the Lord. The New Testament says, it is written. So these two mean the same thing. It's just the Old Testament says it in a different way. And when it says it is written in the Greek of the New Testament, it's in the perfect tense. It means it stands written. It has been there forever. It will always be there. The word doesn't defend the fact it was written by God. It assumes it as a fact. And we do believe it too, just like we do the theory of gravity. We don't have to go prove it. It just works. John the Baptist said this in John chapter one, verses 19 through 23, where he simply said the Pharisees were asking, he responded with a scripture. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. I want you to notice this in your King James or other translations. I am the voice of one with a small O. I change it this way. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. I need nothing else to prop up what I'm saying. God said it. I'll see you right after the break when we come back. John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without the Word of God, our lives would be unstable and without direction. There would be no hope for believers or, for that matter, the entire world. In this seven-part series, Pastor Bob Yandian emphasizes and explains the vital necessity of the Word of God in the life of every believer. Sermon titles include A More Sure Word of Prophecy, The Inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God's Reputation, The Wisdom of God's Word, The Merchandise of Wisdom, Wisdom, Riches, and Honor, and Jesus, Our Wisdom. To order, go to bobyandian.com. 
Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines are demystified. Redemption, justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. When Jesus talked about himself from the Word of God, he always just quoted the Word of God. He quoted the Word of God about himself and his ministry. You know, he never said, uh, the philosophers agree with me. You know why? Because the philosophers are beneath the Word of God. Why would you go to a lower shelf of those who will verify what you're saying is true? By quoting the Word of God, you can actually have nothing higher. If you don't believe what Jesus said about the Word, then you'll never believe what Jesus said about himself, because he is the Word. He declared himself to be the revealed Word of God. He said he fulfilled Old Testament prophecies and those prophecies about himself. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7 says this, When he came into the world, he said, notice this, when he, Jesus, came into the world, this is in the crib. This is when he was laying in the manger as a baby. He said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. I can guarantee you, this didn't come from his humanity. Now, if he'd have rolled over and said this to Mary, she would have freaked out. Man, he was just born from the inside of him, from the God part of him. He was speaking to God the Father and said, again, when I came into the world, you didn't desire offering and sacrifice. He said, you desired to have a, you gave me a body, but you prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. You have had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. That's all of the Old Testament writings. It is written to me. I've come to do your will. To verify he was the son of God, he quoted the word. He didn't have to quote anybody else. He did ask one time his disciples, who do men say that I am? And then he said, now who do you say that I am? And Peter quoted the word of God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. As a young boy at 12 years old, Jesus spoke of his mission to do the will of God. At the introduction of his public ministry, he spoke to his hometown in the synagogue. And in Luke chapter four, verse 18, here's what it says. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He quoted verbatim Isaiah 61, verses one and two. Notice this, when he said, I have come, and now today is my first day, and I'm gonna fulfill all of this. He didn't quote a philosopher, a famous teacher. He didn't quote some prophet from other religions. He didn't quote some man in government. No, he simply quoted the word of God. He announced to sinners and saints the scripture he was reading was fulfilled in their ears that day. He used Isaiah as his only proof on that day of being the Messiah. He knew how to find the text from Isaiah, though there was no chapters or verse separation. He was well acquainted in handling the verses. Why? He quoted it because he wrote it. He's the author of it. As the introduction of his ministry, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by Satan, and Satan tempted Jesus three times to follow him, and Jesus responded with three quotes from Deuteronomy. At each attack, he quoted the word, it is written, it is written, it is written. 
I come back to this. If Jesus could say it is written, why can't we say it's written? To say it is written, we must know it's written. That's why we must study to show ourselves approved unto God. And what we study, the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance. And the next thing that's so important, then it comes out of our mouth. We begin to quote the word of God. This is how we respond to the world. When the world comes at us, fall back for just a moment. If you don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit will never leave you dangling. He'll never leave you out there to fend for yourself. The moment you simply open yourself up in the midst of something, when your back's against the wall and you have to answer someone in the world who throws some accusation at you for being a Christian, understand something, Jesus was never taken off guard. He had an answer for everything and his answer shut them down. You might think, yes, but he was Jesus. You have the same Holy Spirit Jesus did and he'll bring all things to your remembrance and bring you especially the word of God. So Jesus again asked the disciples what people were saying about him and what then finally they thought about him. And public opinion, you're John the Baptist or Jeremiah. But Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And when Jesus quoted the word of God to believers and unbelievers, Jesus did so from the word of God. They asked him about taxes. He went to the word of God. He defended taxes from the law, giving to God the things that are God's and the things of Caesar's belong to Caesar. Shut down his, his uh, accusers immediately. In marriage and divorce, he went back to Genesis 2, showing that two become one. With all the things against marriage today, with all the things that people are saying about marriage today, we simply need to come back to the word of God. If they believe it, fine. If they don't believe it, fine. But one thing different about what you're saying compared to what they're saying, theirs is not anointed, yours is. Yours grabs attention when you quote the word of God, and especially under the inspiration and power of the Holy Spirit. He explained to the Jews he was eternal God. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the living, not of the dead. Before Abraham was, I am. He simply said in that simple phrase, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. They're not dead. They're still living. Jesus quoted the word on his resurrection day. He joined two men on the road to Emmaus and spoke of his resurrection. He showed himself from Moses throughout all the prophets and gave a panorama of the word of God and spoke about the fact to these two believers on the road to Emmaus, questioning about why Jesus had died, and he answered their questions for him. He showed himself from Moses again throughout the prophets, and he did this quite often when he would quote in the word, but even by quoting a prophet, he was quoting the word of God because he took it from the pages of the word of God. How about the New Testament writers? Well, let's take a look at the gospels and the epistles. Five times Matthew quoted, it is written. Seven times Mark wrote, it is written. 14 times Luke in his gospel and the book of Acts said, it is written. 17 times Paul used the only proof needed, it is written. John said seven times in his gospel, in his epistles, in Revelation, he said, it is written. And one time Peter said, it is written. The word has been twisted that can never be changed. Second Peter chapter 16, verses 20 and 21 says this, we do not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses. We were there when it happened. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Then in verse 20, he went on to say, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, this isn't somebody's opinion. This is thus saith the Lord. And even it comes through Isaiah or Jeremiah or Moses, any of the Old Testament prophets or Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, again, Paul, Timothy, whatever the writer is or whatever book it is, it simply is every voice coming to us, even through different people, all came from the same source. It is the word of God and Jesus came to bring it. Verse 21, for prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It comes back to this. What did Peter say in these verses of scripture? In verse 16, he says, when we were with him in the holy mountain, we saw the Holy Spirit descend on him. We saw this uh, cloud come over. And next of all, we heard God speak from heaven. 
So what he was saying was after that though, in verse 19, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. What's he saying? He said, he's saying, if you can see something that contradicts the word, go with the word. If you hear something contradicting the word of God, go with the word of God, because the word of God is a more sure word of prophecy than what your eyes can see or your ears can hear. There comes a time, as it says over in chapter five of the book of Hebrews, that we can actually have our senses exercised to discern between good and evil, right and wrong. Now that takes a while, but the longer you walk in the word of God, you can actually take what you hear and filter it through the word of God and come out with a scriptural explanation. When other people heard something else, you heard the right thing, because why? You have your senses exercised to discern between good and evil. When even Christians, young Christians come to the table, we saw so-and-so doing this, can take it and filter what you see through the word of God. And again, understand we have a more sure word of prophecy. Why is it important that we don't just give our testimony? It's all right to give your testimony. I think using your testimony when you witness to people is fine to do, but you know what? The ultimate thing you need to do is even bring your testimony back to the word of God. For the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know why we preach the gospel instead of teach it? It's because when you preach something, it's already known. You just declare it. You know why we just declare that the the person needs Jesus? Because they know they do. They may argue about it all they want to, but the moment you tell them you're not happy, you're not joyful, you don't have any peace inside of you, that is so scriptural that they have to, unless they just argue with you, they don't understand what the world system is. They're even operating it, but the moment you use the word of God, it penetrates like that sword into them and they begin to understand something. That's why we simply declare, the Bible says this, and you know what, when it comes to for the word, quoted to an unbeliever. It's so simple, they can't miss it, and they know it's true. You're not happy, and you know it. You know that, you know what, you're on the throne of your life, and you might as well admit it. You have screwed your life up big time. They go, well, well, yeah. Why don't you just simply get off the throne and give it to the creator, the one that created you that knows better than you do what the call on your life is, what the future of your life is, and turn over to him. You're going to find peace for the first time. In other words, make it so simple. Just preach the gospel. Don't try to explain it. Just give it to them and let it fly so they'll understand. So the word of God simply becomes, as it says in that book of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, we have a more sure word of prophecy. The word properly handled as your defense is eternal. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The word of God lives and abides forever. If the world challenges you, then let the word of God defend you. The word compels us to answer compared to the world's religions, philosophers, political, and popular view. Again, I'm going to tell you again, the world compels us to answer, and they always compare what we have to say to the world's religions, the philosophers, the political, and the popular views. Here's the point of it is, popular views change, political views change, philosophies change, religions around the world, there's always new ones being added and new leaders of it. You know why? Because there's one day it becomes outdated, but there's no higher standard in your life than God himself and his word. So the world may fall back on all their philosophers. They may fall back on all these things, but you know what? The word of God lives and abides forever. The God that made this world, the God that made the universe is also the God that wrote the word of God. He also made us. And if he made us, he has a plan for our life. It's simply coming back to this. There's a world out there today that needs the word. Here's the point of it. Today is one of the easiest days ever to declare the word of God because even those that are liberal today can see nothing's happening right. What we wanted to happen isn't the answer. And on top of that, moderate people who are moderate in their viewpoints are looking at what they always thought would be good. And now it's coming. They'll go, "Uh uh-oh, something's wrong with this. And they're looking for the right answers. And I'm simply here to tell you, thank God there's conservative viewpoints of the world, but even that won't save you. It's only the word of God that will save you. You can be a moral sinner and still not go to heaven. You can be a moral sinner and you're simply going to go to hell. Why? Because the only thing that's needed to get into heaven is accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Those names not found written in the book of life were cast in the lake of fire. So it's simple as this. Just tell a person they need Jesus, quote some scriptures to them in love, and let the word of God defend itself and then invite them to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In the New Testament, it stands written, you need nothing else. 
You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.